thank you all for tuning in to this video on Jimmy Washam Fishing. You know, in my opinion, this is by far the most important category or topic or fundamental to be familiar with as not just a weekend angler, just a recreational bass fisherman, uh, any type of fisherman or recreational boater, but especially a tournament angler who is sometimes going to be faced with uh, water conditions, weather conditions that are not the, the most pleasant and perfect conditions to operate a boat in. So this video is about simple uh, fundamentals and maybe a little more advanced stuff on how to operate a boat in rough water, how to do it safely, certain things that you can do to minimize the impact on you and your, your partners in the boat, your passengers in the boat, and more importantly, your boat itself so that you make sure you stay afloat and you make it back safely. What qualifies me to speak on this, on this video? I'll be the first to tell you this is not a video for people that operate their boats on the Great Lakes or offshore in salt water because that's, that's not what I'm familiar with. But uh, just a quick background on me, I've, I've bass fished and operated a boat since I was literally a kid. My dad had me driving a boat at a very young age. Um, but I've operated boats on waters and primarily the south until I started fishing professionally and traveled to the Great Lakes to a lot of big bodies of water. But I do have a, a lifelong experience of operating a boat on some of the biggest southern waters that are most infamous for getting rough. One of those would be Kentucky Lake. Um, I currently reside on Pickwick. There are very certain conditions where it can become really rough. And then I grew up fishing Sardis Lake in North Mississippi and, and on a certain wind, it's one of the roughest lakes I've ever been on. Uh, also, I'm a certified master captain through the U.S. Coast Guard in order to be a charter uh, fishing guide on, lake, on Pickwick Lake where we have commercial barge traffic. But if you fish, reservoirs, big natural lakes, uh, other than something like Lake Michigan, uh, you know, something that just gets in another category than what we're talking about, then this video is for you. Y'all stay tuned. So there are two keys to operating a boat in rough water, in my opinion, and are two categories that you have to consider. And the first one, and there's nothing you can do to change this unless uh, you make a drastic uh, change, but that's the length of the boat. So obviously a 16 foot aluminum John boat is gonna operate totally different than like what I'm sitting in right here, my Phoenix 921 Elite that's 21 foot six inches. The length of the boat determines uh, how you're gonna operate it in rough water, depending on the length of the waves from crest to crest, depending on how deep the troughs are, uh, depending on if those waves are rolling or if they're cresting, white capping is what we call it sometimes. That's all going to depend on the length of your boat. And now that's not to say that if you have that 16 foot John boat that you can't safely navigate rough water, but you're going to do it in a little bit different manner depending on all those factors. And the second category is controlling the nose of your boat. Now that's something that you can make some adjustments to your rig and uh, maybe don't even have to make adjustments, just operate it a little bit differently to control that nose because the number one factor in navigating rough water is keeping that nose out of the water. The nose goes underwater, then you've got problems. So we're going to talk about those two things. First thing is length of the boat. Now, I operated a, a, a Pro Team 175 tracker. Uh, it was 17, I think 17 foot four inches. I could be wrong on that. It was years ago. Had a 60 horsepower. That's what I started bass fishing, club tournaments, some charity tournaments around, around home with uh, when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Now, I was confident to take that boat anywhere around here in, in you know, the, the southeast region. And I fished a lot of tournaments on Kentucky Lake where I felt like it was about as bad as you would ever see it. And I got comfortable operating, maybe maybe young and dumb along with comfortable, but I, I put that boat in some situations that, that were, maybe would seem dangerous, but I, I had the ultimate uh, confidence in holding the nose of that boat up. And that's why it would handle rough water better than what you may just assume a 17 foot aluminum boat with a 60 horsepower engine would, would, would handle rough water with. 
controlling that nose was so easy on that boat because there was less length and because that 60 horsepower engine I had the right prop on it where it it gave direct control to the nose of the boat um, just in, a, in an optimal fashion to allow me to, to navigate waves. Now what I what I would do with that boat and what I would do with this Phoenix 921 Elite is are two totally different things. I would have to zigzag waves. I would have to navigate across and I would really, really, really have to pay attention to how to, if I'm trying to go from, from point A to point B, maybe taking over here to this bank to get out of the wind to run across the waves and then ride down and then come back across. So there were, not only was it slower in navigating rough water, but it was also longer because I had to be very, very cognizant of the route I took. And if, you, if you're operating a boat that is shorter, then you're gonna have to take that into consideration. If you look across uh, the lake and there's a creek down there five miles that you wanna get to, and you say, well, I could run straight to it and get there in, let's say 10 minutes, or I could run across the lake, get to where it's not as rough, and then run down and then maybe back across. And that might take me 12 or 14 minutes because when I get over there in that calmer water, I can run harder. You're gonna have to take that into consideration and always, always, always err on the side of safety. Uh, even if I'm, you know, seconds matter and I'm fishing a professional event and, and you know, it, it, it means the most to me to maximize my time, I'm still going to consider those safer routes. Uh, and, you know, unless it's just something that, that totally is, is, is not even a, you know, a task for my boat to handle. But if the, if the lake's rough, I would rather keep my, my equipment um, taken care of I'd rather keep my back and my health taken care of, the fish in my live well, keep them from getting just pulverized by rough water. Uh, so I'm gonna always consider those, those safer routes and that's something you look at. You look at wind direction, having a map, understanding direction. I, it seems basic and elementary, but I run my map on north up. A lot of guys can't do that and I understand. I encourage you if you have the ability to, to learn Run your, run your map on north up because if you have a west wind, a north wind, whatever direction wind you have, it, running your map on north up, when you zoom out on that map, it is so much easier to look at the body of water that you're on, look at the wind direction and say it's coming out of the west. You can look and see, well, I need to hug this north bank because it turns just enough to keep that west wind from pounding it. If I run the south bank, that west wind's rolling all the way down there um, maybe, you know, it's got a bluff wall down there that's going to reverberate the waves and, and cause a wash tub effect. So uh, that's, that's one key factor that I think helps me make quick adjustments on the fly when I'm running down the lake is running my map on north up. That doesn't mean that you have to do that. If you run it on heading up, which a lot of people are more comfortable with, then you can still do the same thing, but you've just got to be able to calculate it in your head with the turn of the map, the winds out of this direction. You've got a, a a compass on there, you know, a cardinal direction indicators that, that will help you with that. But um, I think that running it on north up makes that easier. Now we've gone over safe routes. Always look for the safest route to avoid the roughest water. Um, the second thing, and the, probably the first thing that should have came before this, is being familiar with the weather. Uh, a lot of the footage I'm using for this video, just because I had it on file, is a recent BFL that I fished on the extreme upstream end of Pickwick. And uh, I was catching fish in the lower end. I got out of the lower end, I'm more familiar with it. Well, the weather indicated that we had uh, a really, really strong north wind. Me being an experienced uh, boat operator on Pickwick, knowing what a north wind does, and looking at the current flow prediction data from TVA, I knew that there was gonna be a lot of current flow uh, coming through the lake, which a lot of areas of Pickwick actually flow south to north. And I know that from, I've seen it at Pickwick, the cr most crazy place I've ever seen it is the Detroit River running from St. Clair to Lake Erie. But I know when you get a wind that impacts directly against a current, you get a collision that causes cresting waves that are far different than any other wave that you'll ever run across in any other situation. They're not long and rolling like what you get on the on the Great Lakes a lot. 
Um, they stack up really tall. They white cap really hard. They've got a crest or a curl to the top of them. And they almost build themselves like little brick walls. And they're dangerous. They're, they're uncomfortable to run in. But uh, what I'm getting at with that is I knew that that situation was going to be created. I felt like I needed to run to the lower end of the lake to give myself the best chance to perform well in that tournament. And I knew that I had a boat that was going to handle it if I operated the boat correctly. So what I did, I made the run in the morning. I timed it. It took me about 45 minutes to get to my first stopping place. Uh, there were sections of the lake that I could run wide open, and then there were sections that I had to slow the boat down to 45 or 50 to navigate those stacked up waves. What I, what I knew, and this is what you have to take into consideration, whether you're just going fishing for five hours or you're fishing, you're practicing all week for a tournament. Uh, you have to, to know the weather. Don't just put your boat in and, oh, it's sunny, it's nice. Uh, it's clear and just assume that the rest of the day is going to be that way. Know the weather, have a good weather app that you're comfortable with. I prefer the weather channel. I don't look at the hourly forecast. I look at the daily because that hourly forecast can be misleading. You look at it and it says, oh, the wind's out of the seven, you know, out of the whatever direction. Well, a seven mile an hour wind, if the daily is forecasted to be 10 to 15, then on the water, it's going to feel like much more than seven, I can assure you. So I've learned just from using the Weather Channel app. I'm not by no means am I trying to sell you an app. You use whatever you're comfortable with, but understand it. Don't be misled by that hourly. And another thing to consider is if you have an overnight wind, the lake in the morning will be far rougher than if you have calm winds overnight and then the wind starts, you know, around daylight, what we see a lot. When you have that overnight wind, that, that lake is constantly rolling overnight and it does not take near as much wind to get it rough and going first thing in the morning. So back to what I was talking about with making that run down the lower end of Pickwick, I knew that the wind was gonna increase. They were calling for gusts up to 30. So I knew, I, based on the weather and, and my experience of reading the weather and then being in the weather, I knew that once that front really blew through, high pressure set in, those gusts started hitting, I knew the lake would be far rougher on the way back than it was on the way down. So I timed it. It took about 45 minutes, a little less, to get to my first stop, uh, starting spot. I ended up fishing even farther beyond that. When I ran back, I gave myself an hour and 15 minutes. Now, I was... I felt like I had the the fish in the live well to, I, I felt like I needed one more bite to potentially have a chance to win that tournament. It turns out, you know, uh, after the weigh-in, I realized, no, I needed two giants because somebody just absolutely crushed them. But I had three big fish and two good solid keepers. I really felt like I needed one more kicker to put myself in contention. But I drew myself a hard line on my clock, on my Lawrence unit, that when it gets to, I had to check in at three o'clock at McFarland Park on the extreme upper end. I was almost to the dam at Pickwick, dang near 54 miles away. And I drew myself a hard line on the clock on the time that at exactly 1.45, I'm leaving. I'm not gonna push it because that's where problems happen. That's when you get into trouble. You don't leave yourself enough time. You're running down the lake. All of a sudden you're halfway there. You're doing the math in your head. You've got uh, 30 miles to go and you've only got 28 minutes to get there the only way you can possibly make it is to run wide open doing 68 miles an hour and then you run into that rough part of the lake where the winds cutting into the current and then you tear up equipment or you hurt yourself or your passengers uh, that's that's probably the most important thing know the weather leave yourself time to navigate this is for tournament anglers if you're a recreational angler then you also have to be aware of that. Leave yourself enough time before dark. If it's rough and coming in, you say, well, I'm gonna fish up here in this creek. I think the wind will lay down, you know, right before dark. Well, don't wait until five minutes before dark on a lake that you're not comfortable with, or you don't have a good flashlight, you don't have good mapping, and all of a sudden you're, you, you get back out headed to where you thought was 10 minutes away and, it, and the lake's still rough, and then it's dark and you're in rough water and you can't see. That's, that's a, a, a terrible situation. So avoid things like that. Leave yourself time to navigate rough water. That's incredibly important because in certain situations, there's only one way that you can safely do it. And if you try to go beyond that, then all you're gonna do is tear your boat up or hurt yourself. So length of the boat, the shorter boats, the, the absolute hardest 
wave or direction to navigate waves with is to run with them, to run where the waves are rolling the same direction that your boat's traveling. The reason for that is the most dangerous situation you're gonna run into in rough water is for the nose of the boat to go underwater, and that's by spearing a wave. And when you spear that wave, you get a wall of water that comes over the side of the boat. It fills the boat. First, it's, it, it's likely to either tear up your trolling motor or your electronics up front, wash rods off the deck. It's gonna hit you and shock you, especially if it's cold water, uh, to the point to where it can even just uh, minimize your ability, your gross motor skills to, to function and just put you in shock. But more importantly, it's filling up the boat with water. You cut the bilges on or the automatic bilge cuts on and hopefully when that, if that does happen, it's enough to pump it out, keep the nose up and not spear the next one. But what happens when the boat gets weight in it, water is about the heaviest thing that we can put in our boat. You know, we could fill it with bowling balls and it wouldn't be nearly as heavy as if we filled it with water. So when that water gets in the boat, and it can even disable the engine. When that happens, the biggest no-no, the biggest thing to avoid is the boat gets water in it, a lot of water, we're talking like over our ankles water, and then the boat turns sideways, say your motor becomes disabled, or you just shut it off and, and start bailing with a bucket. If you let that boat turn sideways in big waves, what happens is they start sloshing, and when when that wave pushes that boat sideways to where, let's say we turn to the right and the waves are coming into the port side or left side of the boat and the starboard or right side of the boat is, is ducking down when that wave sloshes, all that heavy water moves to the starboard side of the boat and it will actually cause it to roll over. You roll over in rough water, I don't have to tell you that's bad news. You don't have anywhere to go except on top of a, a smooth hole that's rocking in the water and then you're dealing with hopefully not cold conditions, but then your boat is 100% immobilized. All it's gonna do is, is go where the waves take it and all you can do is hold on. So one thing that I didn't mention, but I will, this sounds like a great time to mention it. A thousand percent of the time, I don't care uh, what kind of body of water you're on, what kind of boat you're in, it does not matter. Wear a good life vest, it's something that with a safety rating, you know, per the Coast Guard that that meets standards or or exceeds them. And always, if you're operating the boat, have that kill switch on when that big engine's running. Um, it's, I, I won't go into great detail about this because uh, there's so many of them that happen every year, but this one happened close to home last year. Uh, there were two people operating a boat on the Tennessee River and they're riding down the lake. It's a nice, beautiful day. Don't have to worry about navigating rough water. And one of them's hat blows off. The person operating the boat was not wearing a life vest nor a kill switch hooked up to his, to his body. He turns the boat at a speed that was a little bit too fast from what I heard. I wasn't there, obviously. I wish I would have been and could have helped, but the boat is turned at a little bit higher speed the, the keel up front hooks, it does what we call a nose hook, and turns, and the momentum of a nose hook at high speed, when you're not seat belted in, we don't have seat belts on boats, it slung both uh, the, the operator and the passenger out. Well, the boat's still in drive, now it's going in circles, because the propulsion of the engine kicks the wheel all the way over. So now this boat is just going in circles, and you've got two guys out in the river that the only thing that they can do, the only prayer they have is to swim to the bank. Neither one of them are wearing life vests. Maybe one of them was, but I know the operator of the boat wasn't. Um, well, what we ended up out of that situation was one person died, one person made it. But that's obviously the worst case scenario. And it could have been, avo it could have been avoided by a life jacket and a kill switch. It takes me, and I'm not exaggerating, one to two seconds to put my life jacket on. I keep my kill switch attached to it. I'm talking about from the time I sit my butt in this seat and, and, and turn that key when I back the boat off the trailer to the time that I load it on the trailer and kill the engine. Every time that combustion engine's on, I'm gonna have my life jacket on, kill switch attached. It's just not worth it. So now I get off my soapbox on that um, and back to navigating. 
in rough water. So we're going with the waves. That's the easiest time to spear a wave by far. What you're going to do, and, and a lot of this depends on boat length going back to this, but what you have to do is you have to make a decision on the fly right then and there, depending on how far the crest of the waves are, are spread apart, how deep the trough is, and uh, other variables, you have to decide on if your boat is long enough to stretch from the crest of one wave, your boat stretches over that wave and the nose of the boat has to stretch across the trough and then reach the next crest without spearing it, without cutting the top off of it with the nose because then we run into that dangerous situation. And it's hardest to do when you're running with the waves because your, your momentum, what happens when the back of the boat that wave hit that you're navigating over hits the back of the boat, it wants to throw the nose of the boat down. The back of the boat goes up, the nose of the boat goes down. The transom rises coming over this wave, the nose wants to go down into the next wave. So if you, you make this decision, if the boat is long enough to run directly with them. Now that's what you'll, you'll see this footage here of is I'm running directly with the waves and I, determined that it was my boat was long enough from nose to transom to navigate directly with them but it's it's most comfortable to operate to operate your boat with the trim all the way down and the jack plate all the way down if you have a hydraulic jack plate so what you have to do when you're when you're running with them believe it or not you have to give yourself a little bit of trim to right there to it and and able to lift the nose of the boat. You know when you're running on smooth glass and you bump that trim up, you're trimming your engine up, you feel the nose lift. It's the same when you're running 25, 30 miles an hour in rough water, you just don't feel it. So you lift that trim, you put your jack plate all the way down, and what that does is it gives you nose lift. Now we're not talking lifting it all the way into positive trim like that right there, but we're just talking about trimming it up from all the way down, from, from bottomed out, so that you can get that nose lift. And now here's the hardest thing to do when you're running with the waves, directly with them. When you see that rogue wave, you're running in two footers and all of a sudden there's a two and a half footer up there and you see it and you're like, oh my goodness, that one is bigger. Uh, what you have to do is understand you cannot let off of the gas. I'm not saying punch it, because that's also not the right thing to do, but consistent throttle, keeping that prop turning, keeping those RPMs consistent, if not elevating just a little bit, giving it a little more gas when you're approaching that wave. If you don't do that, the worst thing you can do is come up to that big wave, get nervous, and let off, because when you let off the gas, when you let off the throttle, the RPMs, the prop stops turning so fast, the nose wants to fall, and then like we talked about, the transom catches that, that wave and you're coming up to this bigger wave and you get nervous and you let off and now you're spearing the biggest wave in the set of waves and you're taking even more water over. So what you have to do with, with steady RPMs or even accelerating slightly as you come up to that wave, yes, you're gonna hit it. There's nothing you can do to avoid that. Hopefully your stuff is strapped down, your, your passenger's holding on and you're holding on. You're gonna, you're gonna hit the wave and there's gonna be some impact, but we're not talking about launching in the air, but if you accelerate on the wave before the rogue wave, the very first wave, that, you know, the very wave before it, if you accelerate a little bit when you hit that one, the goal is to lift the nose. So you, you lift the nose. We're not talking about going completely airborne unless it's so big that you have to, but we're talking about keeping good lift on the nose so that that next wave the nose is going to crest the top of it rather than cut the top of it off. So, so that way you're keeping that nose elevated. That's with jack plate all the way down, a little bit of trim uh, up, you know, the engine in a, in a more of a trim situation than down. And it's up to you and your boat, knowing your prop, if you have a jack plate, knowing it, how your boat performs, to understand exactly where that is. There's no perfect answer for it. I can't tell you, you need to have, you know, your jack plate set on six and your trim set on 2.5 on your Mercury Smart Monitor. That's, that doesn't apply because every boat, every engine, 
every jack plate, every prop is different. So that just takes a little bit of experience. Obviously, don't buy a new boat and go out and say, let's go, let's go run this lake on a, on a day where the wind's blowing 30 and, and see what it'll do. You know, you, you take baby steps learning your equipment before you're confident enough to go and, and do this. Now let's switch it around to uh, running with those waves with a boat that's not long enough to stretch between them, like what I used to have to do in my bass tracker. So now you're going to quarter those waves. And we're not talking about uh, a 10 or 20 degree quarter because that can actually be more dangerous because those waves, you've got a distance between the waves and when you quarter them at 10 degrees, you're just putting a little bit more distance and now that shorter boat has even more trouble. But we're talking about quartering at like 35 to 50 degrees and now you're really quartering enough to run almost sideways with them. And what that does is really, really stretches the gap that you're impacting crest to crest because those crests are what gets us. That's, that's what gets us when we're running with waves. So what you're gonna have to do in a boat that's not long enough to stretch from crest to crest going directly with them, you quarter them at that degree, uh, find the best degree that's, that's most comfortable. The, the more, the, the higher degree that you go directly 90 with them, say, you know, 60, 70 degrees where you're, you're, you're basically almost running, the wave is running this way and you're running, you know, you're running, I'm sorry, the wave is coming this way and you're running at that degree, that's gonna be more comfortable than if the wave's coming this way and you're running that degree, you're gonna have less bounce with the nose, less uh, impact on the, the stability of the boat as you navigate those crests. Obviously, if you're going five miles down the lake and you navigate those waves you crisscross at 60 degrees, you're gonna to have to make a lot more crisscross, you're gonna travel a lot more and take a lot more time than if you go at 30 degrees. Um, that's less crisscrosses, more of a direct line. But back to what I said, safest travel route, that's by far the most important. So uh, you have to make that decision on how hard you can quarter into those and still navigate with them. When you make the turn, so if you're navigating these gigantic rollers, at some point when you're zigzagging left and you get, reach the bank and the waves are coming down the lake and there's no way to get out of them, you're gonna have to make that turn. The worst thing you can do is stop and let one come over the back or lollygag and make a slow turn and then spear one as you're turning back when you're coming with them. So what you need to do is control of the nose is very important. You trim, you make sure you're trimmed down enough to where you have good response with, with your throttle control as far as accelerating and decelerating. So you're, you're trimmed down. And when you make that turn, you time the wave to where you're coming up on one. And really as you're approaching the crest is when you wanna make that turn so that the nose, if it does go over the crest, and ducks down, it's ducking into the trough as you're turning, rather than going over the crest, and then you make that perfect turn to where you're zero degrees down, you know, downstream with the waves, then you have to worry about spearing that next wave. So make a good, sharp, deliberate turn. We're not talking about crazy donuts and slinging everybody out, but don't lollygag on that turn and let the nose poke the next wave. So now we're gonna talk about running directly with them. Nose control is still very important. What you have to do is keep the nose out of the waves, but it's easier to do when you're running with them. Now, once again, length of the boat. If your boat is long enough to stretch from crest to crest, run straight into them. That's the most comfortable way to do it. You're, you're gonna have to have more trim than what, than what the boat would have just being bottomed out on trim. I always in rough water want to keep my jack plate down on my boat, on, on any boat that I've ever run with a hydraulic jack plate. That goes back to my, uh, you know, my Rangers, um, uh, anything I've ever had with a hydraulic jack plate. But jack plate all the way down because that puts the prop farthest down in the water. That gives me the most command over the nose of my boat and, and just the boat in general. And then I'm going to lift the trim to where it gets where I can operate at a lower speed without it porpoising. I want it as high as I can operate that boat without slowing down to 25, you know, 30, whatever it requires me to slow down to, to navigate it. I wanna have that trim 
as high as I can, but still be able to operate at low speed without the, the nose of the boat wanting to porpoise. So uh, as, I'm, as I'm going into those waves, once again, you don't want to stop. But if you see that rogue wave, this is the difference in running with them, running with the waves, waves going this way, the boat's going with them, or running against them, waves coming into the boat. If you see that rogue wave, sometimes it's best, rather than accelerating to, to lift the nose, to actually decelerate as you approach it. And what that does is sometimes when you hit that first, that wave before it and you decelerate, it's just gonna allow the, the boat to coast a little bit and lift that nose. Now, don't, don't come off because once you come off of, of pad, where the boat is, is up and, and running on pad, once you come off of that, you're sitting lower in the water and the next wave, you're really, really gonna take it. You're gonna poke that next wave and, and take water over and then you're gonna have trouble getting back on pad because now you're weighted down with water. So we're not talking about extreme deceleration, but a slight deceleration when you come up on that rogue wave to let more of the, of the, the I guess the throat of the, of the hull hit that wave rather than direct nose. Um, that's the primary difference in running with them and running against them. Uh, against them, decelerate on those, on those rogue waves slightly and allow that nose to, to lift as you come over the, the wave just before the, the rogue wave or the biggest wave. Now, quartering against them is probably the most uncomfortable ride that you're gonna experience. And the reason for that is the way these bass boat hulls are designed or john boat or whatever you have a flat side on the boat obviously quartering with them you have waves that are impacting a hard flat side of the boat and you've got all the momentum from the weight of that wave hitting the side of the hull and it creates a lot of wander with your nose that you're really having to steer against and it just creates impact that's what's loosening bolts, that's what's tearing up trolling motors, that's what's just making it plain uncomfortable and breaking your back. So I try to avoid quartering with them unless it's an absolute must, like I'm running somewhere like Toledo Bend where I'm in a boat lane and I just have to go one direction and can't get out of it because I, I would be in standing timber or an unsafe uh, area of water to navigate. Um, I would rather run directly into them or turn completely sideways or if not just slightly uh, slightly below 90 degrees of going sideways across the waves. That's probably the most comfortable way to navigate rough water if you just have the option. Um, once again that depends on where point A and, and where your destination is point B. And, and what direction the waves are and if it's safe to navigate the water that requires you to get to that destination. So try to avoid quartering them. And we're talking about if we're facing the wave, we're talking about that 45 degree quarter. Um, even, you know, 10 degrees is okay, but once you get beyond about 15, then you really are, are just exposing that side of the hole for that wave to impact. So you wanna avoid that if you can. Um, let's talk about if you do become disabled. So that's a big deal. If you spear a wave and you become disabled, then you need to figure out some type of way to keep that boat from turning sideways and being rocked because that's where you flip. Now, this is a bigger risk on the, on the Great Lakes and places where you get those really long rolling waves and it really sloshes that boat, but it can happen and it has happened. I can't tell you how many times on places like Sam Rayburn uh, Santee Cooper. It's even happened on Sardis Lake where I mentioned in North Mississippi. It's happened a bunch at Kentucky Lake. So don't think that this is something that doesn't apply to you. You spear that wave, it disables your engine, your boat fills up with water. You've got to keep the boat facing into the waves if at all possible. Now the, so if, if your engine becomes disabled, the, it may just be totally impossible and all you can do is hold on. Don't, don't tie yourself to the boat. I've heard about that. Um, if, you, if you do secure yourself to the boat, then use a rope and leave yourself plenty of slack. Because obviously if I, if I decide to tie myself to this driver's seat and the boat flips over, I'm in a world of trouble. So if you, it's not a bad idea to, if, if you're in wide open water and you know if you flip over, the only thing you have to, to a prayer to grab onto is the boat, 
then it's not a bad idea to leave yourself 10, 15 foot of, of rope and, and be sure that you can detach yourself if need be in a stressful and, and wild environment like sloshing around in rough water. But it is good to secure yourself to the boat so that you don't get separated from it. The trolling motor may be an option if you can safely get up there and deploy it without getting thrown over and then try to keep that trolling motor, uh, just try to keep the nose, if at all possible, pointed into the waves because that's the, the least likely situation where you're gonna have rollover. Um, another thing that you wanna consider if you have power poles and your boat becomes disabled in rough water, deploy those poles. The reason for that, uh, it sounds obvious, but in stressful situations, I, I'm former law enforcement and I, in my past training and past experiences, I know that uh, the the brain just totally goes foggy when you get in, uh, you know, when you have that adrenaline dump and you forget things that are obvious, but drop those, deploy those poles because at some point in time, your boat's gonna reach land. And if it reaches a rock jetty or a bluff wall or uh, something that's unsafe for waves to be pounding it against, you want those poles to catch bottom before your boat gets to that, uh, whatever that obstruction is to prevent from just basically trashing your boat and possibly hurting yourself. So um, rough water, I don't care if you're out in the middle of the lake, deploy those poles. That's enough drag in the water to try to keep it from getting perfectly sideways in the waves and, and prevent that from happening. Obviously, you would also want to get out a throw float and have it available. Um, I've even done this and, and just, you know, bad rough water had a throw float. Like I normally keep it up here in the, the starboard rod locker. Well, I had pulled it out and put it right here in the middle day box where it's easy to access. Something like that is just preparation for the worst. Could save your life. Um, have the equipment that you need. It's a requirement on Great Lakes and a lot of big bodies of water to have a whistle, uh, a flare, a rescue flag, and some other key equipment. But, you know, have that stuff, even if it's not a requirement, have it in case you need it. It's a very small amount of money. You throw it in your boat, you keep it dry in, a, in a, you know, one of those good waterproof bags, and it'll last a long time, and it may save your life. So safety equipment's real important as well. Um, I hope that you've learned a lot from the video and navigating with those big waves, navigating against them. It's length of boat and then it's control of the nose. Those are the two factors that you want to keep between your ears to be cognizant of. Know your equipment. Um, it, know that your prop gives your the nose of your boat the most command. You'll have to, I'm not going to make the video any longer and talk about that, but uh, you know, the pitch of your prop, how many blades you're running can give you more control over the nose. So do your research on that. Be confident with your equipment. Uh, know that it's gonna handle well. Always check bolts, uh, anything that could possibly be loose. Make sure that that stuff is safe, bolted down. Eliminate any option for there to become a problem in rough water because when you have to stop to, you know, tighten down a, a a graph mount or something like that, that's where you can run into those problems. So have all your equipment uh, good to go. Navigate that rough water safely at the lowest speed that you can. And one, the last thing that I'll talk about, I left this out, but uh, this is probably the most important. Let's say things, things develop and you find yourself in a situation where you cannot drive the boat on pad in the water because it's so rough that there's just no way you can do it. I've been in that situation, um, it's, it can present itself. The waves are just so big that a bass boat, which was not made for waves like that, cannot navigate them. <clears throat> the best thing that you can do, idle is really not safe, any safer than running on pad and that stuff because your nose is so susceptible to taking on water. The best thing you can do is what I call plow. And if you, if you think about when you're getting on pad, so you, you got it trimmed down, the jack plates down, or, or the jack plates wherever, but the trim, the engine trim, is all the way down. You increase your throttle, the nose of the boat stands up, and you've got that moment where the nose of the boat stands up and the transom has to lift enough to get on what we call pad back there, the way the transom, the hull is designed, and the back part of the boat, and then that nose is gonna drop back down and now we're on pad. The boat is riding higher than if it's at idle. 
in the water. There is a sweet spot between there where you can keep that nose up and do what I call plow. And sometimes that's the absolute only way that you can navigate safely. I've done it numerous times in really cold water because I just don't want to take the chance on spearing a wave if it's 35 degrees outside and the water's 45 degrees, uh, you just run into issues where you can get hypothermia. That's something you have to consider. So numerous times when we have those situations, I'll, I'll plow rough water. But I've also been in the situation where I just knew if I tried to run it, I was gonna spear multiple waves, possibly tear up my equipment, but more importantly, take on water and, and create an unsafe situation. So, so at, at a point where it's not it's not where you first get the nose lift, and it's not where the nose starts coming back down, but there's a sweet spot right in there, and it's generally about, so you, the nose gets to its highest point and then starts to, to level back off, and it's somewhere right after the highest point where you can let off or feather that throttle and actually keep the nose up there before it sends it all the way over to pad and it, then the boat levels off. When you do that, it generally takes you being trimmed all the way down or close to it. If you, if you find that perfect spot where you can plow and the nose is up high and it, you know, it, it's, you hear the engine working, it's that almost on pad, but not quite. And the trim is down. If you try to trim up too much, you're actually gonna get slippage. The prop will cavitate, it'll get too close to the surface and suck air, uh, or it, it just it slips and then you can't control the nose. So you're generally trimmed all the way down or, or really close to it, jack plates all the way down. And if you give it too much gas, you're gonna, too much throttle, then you're gonna lose that sweet spot of plowing and it's actually gonna send it on pad and level it off. If, if that happens, let off, but don't let all the way off to where that nose rises and then find the sweet spot again and then give yourself more throttle to where you maintain that nose being not stuck up straight up in the air but up much higher than what you can achieve when you're actually operating the boat on pad now when you plow you can it doesn't matter if you're going into them or with them that's the very best way to keep your the nose of your boat out of the waves now it, it's you're generally operating at 12 to 15 miles an hour when you do this depending on the boat if it's a fiberglass boat um, that is obviously time consuming but that is far better than than punching waves uh, taking the top off of waves taking water over and and getting in an unsafe situation so plowing is something that you you can go out when there's just a little chop and practice on that sweet spot and finding the the sweet spot in the throttle, feather in the throttle to keep that nose lifted where you can plow. Um, that's not something you want to do in shallow water because your your lower unit of your engine, your prop, is is farther under the water than uh, than a normal operation because the nose is up, the transom's down, the, the engine's far under the water. But uh, if you've got the depth to do it and the waves are so big that you can't operate on pad, then be familiar with how to plow and keep that nose up and get where you need to go. So guys, I know I did a lot of talking. Um, I, I hope that the footage that I interjected in during the conversation helps you get an idea on how to navigate in rough water. You know, it's, it, it sounds simple for somebody that that's done it for a lifetime, but a lot of guys have just, they maybe haven't been taught, haven't been shown, haven't had the experience to learn for themselves. So, I hope that, unlike me, where, where it just took a lot of experience, thankfully I had my father show me, um, but unlike me that learned by mostly experience, I hope that you can learn something from this video and it, and it helped expedite you being comfortable navigating your boat in rough water. So if there's something else that, uh, that y'all think about, then please drop a comment, let me know. And if there's another part of this topic that you want me to talk about, then leave me a comment. I, I love to interact with y'all and I appreciate uh, everybody that interacts and comments on the videos. So it means a lot to me, but uh, hopefully this helps with navigating rough water in your bass boat. It's something that's a must have for recreational anglers, recreational boaters, and especially for tournament anglers. So thank y'all for tuning in and we'll catch you around the corner.